Messias la da lunga su Leao, Leao, Leao contro Kumainers, Leao, 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 Goal! Ha segnato Leao! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sempre Milan podcast. I'm your host, Ollie Fisher, joined once again by Anthony Talgrud. What's up guys? Glad to be back. Um, we got Madison. We're all three of us finally back for the first time in, I think, since the uh, Tactical Manager episode. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. I've been on the bonus pods, not the actual pods. Yeah. yeah no, it was me and you last week. It was us last week, me and Ollie the yeah. week prior, and the four of us the week prior with uh, Tac Manager. Yeah, is so that the, Jesus the three Christ? Amigos. Seems like so long ago. And I, I mean, you passed a late fitness test to be here, you know. So <laughs> you were out until like go. five minutes ago. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So I'd be appreciative, everybody. You've got the three of us making fools of ourselves um, for reasons that will become apparent in a minute, and are probably already apparent based on the thumbnail and title of this video. Um, if you can see balloons in the background, I apologize for the scruffy backdrop. Today is my birthday, so uh, don't don't. Ever accuse me of of, um, being work shy? I'm here producing pods on the day that I turn 27. I feel like an old bastard. God knows what you two feel like. Um, But Milan stopped for nobody, so we're going to power ahead. Before we get into this week's episode, and it's going to be a fun one, it's going to be an exciting one. It's the one that I look forward to every year, or maybe twice a year when you think about the the episodes where we look back at them. But yeah, um, we, we wanted to say thank you to all of our subscribers on Substack. Uh, Thank you so much for supporting what we do. Um, We really hope that you're enjoying the bonus content that we're putting out on there, which includes podcasts, um, longer form stuff that Isaac's putting together, deep dives, that kind of thing. Go check it out if you haven't already. You can do a week for free. But our founding members are Ali Tareen, Tito, Mike, Moritz Pullman, Joey Gala and Kemin. So thank you to those for for being um, being extra supporters of what we do, shall we say? Um, and uh, AJ, before we jump in, got a little uh, got a little display, I believe, to show to the camp. Yeah, so uh, we got something we want to show off. It's Display Pro is the company. And basically, it's a cool new way to display your jerseys instead of having to get a really expensive, fancy uh, glass case, you know, a fo- photo frame, cost you hundreds of bucks, might even be put in really weird. In fact, I uh, was a victim of that. Madison will remember I had one that just looked god awful. <laughs> but this one uh, is simple, and it's the third shirt I put on it because it's just held together by magnets. Super simple to do. Um, looks nice. I was going to be ironic and have a CDK jersey up here. Um, <laughs> but I, I couldn't bring Not myself it. to do it because I actually like the way it looks and I wanted it on my wall. So, um, yeah, again, real simple. You fold it on there. It's got magnets to hold it. And then you just a hook in your wall and it just hooks on like that. Real simple. Uh, fairly cheap price as well. Go to displaypro.shop to, to get one. Or scan this QR code with your phone. So I'll leave it up there for just a few seconds for you. And yeah, check out Display Pro. It's pretty dope. Yeah, really, really good and run by uh, a close friend of the site as well. Um, so so definitely go and check them out. Uh, genuinely, you know, plug aside, like I, I've had it priced up to get jerseys framed before. Um, signed ones, special ones, stuff like that. The frame itself is never that expensive, but it's the... It's the pinning, it's the the placement, you know, like to make it look like a professional mm-hmm. framing job costs hundreds, and that looks superb for a fraction of the price. And yeah, it does. Yeah. as 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 AJ said um, before we started recording, like it's third third shirt you've had in there or whatever, because it's so easily interchangeable. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to get more of them. And, and just to make it clear, this isn't even really an ad. Like we're not paid to say this. It's just genuinely a great product. So you guys should get it because, as you mm-hmm. can see, well, you can't see today, but. I have a million jerseys on a hanger in front of my window. So now they're going to be on the wall in a nice fancy display. So, Yeah, big up that product. Uh, really, really cool. And I feel like it's been a long time coming. So fair enough for, for finding that gap in the market. And I uh, hope people go check it out and enjoy it. It's time, boys. 2023-24 season is upon us. Um, we are, uh, Well, we haven't finalized this yet, but... I think we're going to record one more episode before the Bologna game when we can preview that game, potentially next Sunday, next weekend, sometime around then, when we can we can lend a bit more time to that first game of the season and, and talk a bit about our expectations for Milan uh, going into that season. But this week, it felt like the perfect time. Now, pre-season's done for every team to do our 2023-24 predictions. We've broken it down, as we always do, into a number of different categories, some Milan-specific 
um, the rest related to, to the league and who'll finish where and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, this is always exciting. It's great now. And then it's even funnier in 10 months when we get to look back and see how much of it we got wrong. Um, later this week, it will be available in article form too. But, you know, we like we, we want to talk through our choices and, and say why we've picked what we've picked. So it's always good to get it out on the podcast and um, also want people to get involved with this. You'll You'll hear the categories. We'll probably list them in the description, actually. And then you can reply with your picks as well. We want everyone to get involved. And uh, we might do a prize for whoever comes closest or something like that. Um, but, yeah, let, let's make this as interactive as possible. So here we go. The predictions for next season. We're going to start with the obvious one. Uh, the three relegated... To- no, I'm joking. Uh, where will <laughs> Milan finish next season? The book is... So I've, I've got the bookmakers up here on odds checker. So it like cross compares the odds. The bookmakers don't know everything, of course, but they tend to be a pretty good gauge of like public opinion mixed with knowledge. You know, they're, they're going with where the trends are going, but also like they're pretty good at picking winners for games and therefore winners for leagues and stuff. Like they've got Man City to win the Premier League for a reason and, and all that. Um, so the bookies have us all over the place. Nobody knows where we're going to finish, really. Um, our prices are, are, are high and short and you know, everywhere. Uh, but I can tell you that looking across the board, we're pretty much fourth favourite to win the league. Fourth favourite. So we'll go AJ, then we'll go Maddie, then we'll go me. All right. Um, well, the bookmakers have us finishing fourth. Well, I have us finishing first. Uh, I, I think we're really going to sneak it this year. I just had this weird suspicion. You know, I'm watching interest preseason games. Summer can't stop a shot to save his fucking life. Taram can't score a goal to save his fucking life. Um, they're losing everyone. The people they've signed just, they, they don't move me, you know? Um, I was going to say Smart Smartvik, the guy from Udinese, Smart, does yeah. move me, but uh, guess who decided to pull out of that deal? Him. So <laughs> they didn't sign that guy. They signed uh, Fratesi, uh, otherwise known as the Italian bum. That guy sucks. And um, I don't know who else they've signed, if anyone, but yeah, I'm not impressed with them. I think Napoli have lost Kim, and that's going to be a glaring difference. I think people are really underestimating how important that was to them. Obviously, um, Kavarskelia is still there. Ossiman's probably going to renew. Um, and I think they're going to stay, and that's going to be big. But I would be shocked if Kavara continues that form into next season. I just think it was you know, lightning in a bottle. And, and I really don't think they could hit two years in a row. Um, Ossiman's still going to be great. And it sounds like Zielinski might be going to Saudi Arabia now as well. So if they lose that core after losing Spalletti and Guantoli, I, I just think it, it might be a little much for them. I still have them finishing high, but I don't know if they're going to go back to back or anything like that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys answer because, you know. <laughs> I also had them finishing first, which is funny because I don't think I've had them finishing first any season that we've done this. Um, I just think that with the attacking players that we've added, in the midfield depth, if Pioli can get the tactics right, if, big if, we can win the league. I I, I am with the bookmakers on this. I am with um, everyone else on this, really, uh, in terms of being non-Milan fans. Um, I, I'm finding it really hard for us to call us heading into next season because there's been so much change. You know, we lost Maldini and Massara. Fellani and Moncada have done a good job bringing in a number of different players, but we've got to see how they gel. Um, pre-season results, there were some good ones in there, but generally speaking, the, there were some concerning signs as well. Not that you put tons of weight into pre-season results, but that's what we have to go on at the moment, and I think there are still some issues to address. There's also a disclaimer on this, is that we're recording with over two weeks of the transfer window left. You know, Another team, possibly us, because the financial position we're in, could go out and make another big splash in that completely turns the cards on the table. But as things stand at the moment, I've got us in third. Um, I am. I, I, I can understand why people are going big on us and bold on us. Um, Ewan, for example, who, who is a writer for the website, he's actually a Roma fan. Not many people know that, but um, he is putting us first. So I think the outside opinion is that we've signed well, we've we've fixed some of our big issues, we spent the Tonali money well, but I, I still see the, the problems from last season and I also see Pioli as a bit of a problem too. 
Um, I, I don't know how far he can necessarily take us in terms of balancing the competitions. So I've got us third um, because I think there I will be think, two stronger teams. Um, I, I do think Pioli is a big question mark, and those opening 10 games is going to tell us a lot. But if we, we get past that and we're in the top three, then the rest of the first half of the season, at least, is smooth sailing. Um, one reason that tells me we've made the best signings Every single rival fan base keeps making fun of them. And mm. we're not talking about anyone else's signings because we don't know them. We're signing too many for, for us to even pay attention to the teams. But <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that is If true. they weren't scared of our signings, they wouldn't be talking about them. Anyways, mm. uh, I guess mm -hmm. this next category is only for you since Madison and I gave ours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, so, for me, I want to be wrong on this, but I... I think that stability could be quite big heading into next season because a lot of teams have lost a lot of pieces both on and off the field. And I I got into winning the league. Um, I, I hope that this serves as a jinx. And I actually agree that their, their transfer window hasn't been particularly uh, inspiring either, to be honest. Um, obviously, they sold Onana for big money and they haven't necessarily gone out and... And, and splashed all of that yet. Um, Sommer's a downgrade without a doubt. Um, they've had to spend money buying Aslani permanently. They signed Bisek from uh, from a team called Our House. Uh, they got Fratesi, who I suppose is a good piece for the midfield. Um, Turam and Quadrado on freeze. I mean, the fans were protesting about Quadrado. But yet, what they have got is a solid system, a solid formation, and they've got a coach who seems to be able to get the most out of those pieces like Chalanoglu playing as a as a regista was something that you know didn't really think would work and, and yet it got them to the Champions League final um, and they've got Lautaro and they've got Barella and they've got Bastoni and they've got Di Marco and I just think they've, they've still got a very strong core and um, and if it clicks perhaps without the distraction of a run late into European competition I think they might be quite difficult to stop so, yeah, I've got into winning the league, and I hope that this serves as my jinx. Well, we got some uh, difference of opinion when you hear my top Probably four. Then. Um, my top four, and this is in order of where teams are going to finish. Mm -hmm. I got Milan up top, obviously. I think Juventus second, having no European competition and that consistency that Ollie's talking about. They really didn't lose too many players, and they have Allegri again, and they really hit the end of last season running pretty well, so... They continue that. I think they're they're in a good spot. Probably second, third place. I have Napoli. Um, you know, good good team. Didn't lose. Well, they lost a lot, but not everything. You know, they still have the two two main guys up top. And then fourth place. This might be a little controversial, but I got Roma sneaking in. I think they might uh, be able to pull it off. I don't know why. I just didn't want to put Inter there. So Roma yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, Milan is one. Napoli has two because I think that Napoli is still going to be very strong. Inter third and Juve are going to squeeze in at fourth. I think this is is potentially the toughest top four to, uh, since last season, maybe. But like the the, the toughest top four battle, um, just because of how much has changed in the league. Um, I think so many fans of rival clubs and 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 pundits and what have you were saying that the three biggest teams. Milan into Juve are nailed on for top four. I don't see it that way. Um, I think that Inter win the league, as I've said. I think Napoli finish second. I think that they're... That I think the quality is still there. They've lost Kim, but I actually think they've signed quite well, to be honest. Some of the players that have arrived, people won't have heard of if you you know just casual watchers and what have you, but that's what served them so well last year. Obviously, the change of coach and change of sporting director is massive. I don't think Rudy Garcia is going to be able to get the same out of that group as Spalletti, but I don't think he's a terrible manager either. And I think in Serie A, he's still got those weapons at his disposal, those front two who could combine for 60 goals and what have you. So I, I've got them finishing second in the league. I don't think they'll have a monumental drop-off just because of how many of the pieces are in place from, from last season. And in fourth place, I have Lazio. Um, I... Therefore, do not think Juve will finish in the top four. Um, Lazio, I've signed very well. Um, they, they haven't lost anybody. 
uh, apart from Milinkovic Savic, Savic yeah. which is a big a big piece to replace. But I think that they've signed well to replace. Um, I, I like the signing of Isaacson. I like the signing of um, of I've forgotten who else they've signed already. But there you go. No, I've got the list. I'm going to look it up. There was one that I really liked. Um, who, uh, uh, Picking uh, like uh, three, four, five, oh, and six Kamada. is really difficult. Kamada came in. Castellanos, I don't know anything about really. Um, and Cancellari is not a terrible player. Um, but yeah, they're, they're okay. And Sarri is always an added value. And they finished second last season. So for them to finish outside the top four would constitute a, a big drop off that I don't. I don't think they're going to have, uh, to be honest. I don't see them finishing top four two seasons in a row, though. Yeah, I don't think they have the depth to go. Yeah. They, I, I think that, obviously, they've lost Milinkovic Savic, which is big, but they were preparing for that. They knew that, that that was their last season of him. Everything else is still there. Everything. And they've I mean, signed look a at couple us. of good players. Our Scudetto winning season compared to last season. We lost Cassie. Cassie? You know? Cassie, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I suppose. I suppose huge difference. It is as big as... Yeah, I don't think yeah, Kamada's yeah. the replacement, obviously, for Milinkovic Savage. I think he'll but... do well, though. Yeah, I don't think he'll be a bad player. Um, obviously, we were heavily linked, but yeah, I don't know. Well, uh, I'll just start talking then because the next category, fifth through seventh, mm. um, I had Lazio in fifth. I, I think mm. everything all he's saying is right, but I just don't think they have the depth to continue with the Champions League. You know, I think. That's going to really hurt their start to the season. And it might be just too far gone to, to make that big gap. Unless another team has a um, Milan-esque January next season where they just fall off in the second half of the table and, and close their own 24-point gap. Um, Fix is where I have Inter. I, I really think without Lukaku, without Dzeko, Wataru is not enough. And we saw how... Correa just can't score a goal all last season and even this preseason. We're seeing it with Taram now as well. They don't really have the players for that two-striker formation anymore. They're going to have to find a change, which is going to hurt that consistency that we just talked about. I, I really think they're going to fall off, and it's going to be steep. The financial aspect of it is just piling on and on and on. I mean, they're about to sign Arnautovic, who is their fifth-choice striker, and they've been close. They've had personal terms agreed with all their strikers that they wanted that they can't buy anyone because they don't have the money. And I think we're seeing that with all the players. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. And they're no longer going to be able to flip for profit. They're going to have to start signing those older players. And I really think they're going to be looking at like a Milan 15, 16 type of season. So I don't think it's good for Inter. Um, seventh place. This is a fun one for me. I think it's Monza. I think they're going to sneak in there. They finished last season wow. really strong. And I don't think they got weaker. Watching how they played in the, the Berlusconi Trophy, or Trofeo Silvio Berlusconi, whatever they want to call it now. Um, I don't know. They seem a little hungry. You know, they, they really want to win something. And I think they're going to make a push and sneak into Conference League. Mm. I had a really hard time doing like third, fourth, fifth, and sixth because all those teams are like arguably this is the strongest like top seven that Syria has had in probably like the last 10 seasons. I have Roma, Atalanta, and then Lazio in seventh. No reason why. It's just like I really wanted to put Roma in the top four, but I don't think that they're going to get it, so I put them fifth. Um, Atalanta, they always kind of surprise us, right? They mm. lose a big name, and then all of a sudden like they get a little bit stronger. No one knows how, but they do they it. Get a, they get a big name. Yeah, and uh, Lazio, I don't see them being as strong as they were last year. Mm. Um, I've got Juve in fifth. I think it will shock some people that I've got them finishing outside the top four, but things were... They, they strung together results last season, which would have got them without the points deduction. Obviously, they amassed enough points to get into the top four. Um, but People forget how toxic it was. And I don't feel like it's any less toxic. And I don't feel like they've made any signings. Apologies for, for um, insulting Tim Weyer here. But I don't think they've made any signings at all to particularly get anybody excited. And I think the Allegri thing is on such a tightrope at the moment. 
and the Benucci fallout as well, like him getting such an unceremonious booting out of the door. Um, I, I see them as being a club prime to explode. <laughs> and while, while they may not have European competitions, and that will allow them to focus, obviously, on on their, their domestic um, matters, there's going to be more stuff overhanging them, I think, in the season to come, which will, will make things even more uncertain. Um, and I can see them struggling. I can see them having another bad start, and this time they don't have that run of one nils because that was a lucky run, let's be honest. They didn't play well in that run of one-goal wins that they had. And we beat them twice last season. In fact, pretty much every team around them that they came up against made them look like dog shit. And I just don't think that they can... They can put that run together again. So I've got them finishing fifth. Um, they'll just about do do enough to get in and around there. Um, and then I have Roma in, in sixth place. Roma are Paolo Dybala and Paolo Dybala can't stay fit. So that's what's going to put them in sixth place, I think. Uh, and then in seventh place, I have Atalanta. Um, I think that they... They will just be Atalanta. They will win a game 5-3 and then they will lose 1-3-0 the next week. You know that, That's them, that's Gasparini, that's what they're leaning into. Let's hope it unlocks CDK form-wise, either so we can sell him there or we can um, welcome back a better player. Um, they're going to be an interesting team to watch, as are Fiorentina, as are Monza. Monza were a team that I was going to mention as being a potential to sneak in to the top seven. I just don't know how the season post-Berlusconi is going to go. And they've lost Carlos Augusto to, to Inter, which is a good signing for them, to be honest. Wait, when did um, that happen? Like in the past few days. Oh, I don't believe he's been announced week. yet, but he's 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 oh gone. okay, he's gone. AJ, uh, listen, then, oh, after your flight on Friday, a lot's happened. It sounds like it, dude, because I haven't like I didn't check any news until I got in today, but I didn't go back in time to read the old news. And yeah, right. I keep hearing. Well, I feel like I'm, uh, all, again, you've been like, wait, when did this happen? <laughs> yeah. In the space of about an hour, Jack Harrison was joining Everton permanently, then Aston Villa permanently, and then Everton on loan. <laughs> so a lot can change. And Ber- um, Benucci went from joining Fiorentina, uh, which I was about to slate as a, as a mindless signing for a club that's trying to build like they are, to now joining Union Berlin, who are one of the most exciting teams for young talent, and yet they've decided to go for him. So that is wild, to be honest. Um, yeah, that, really tough to call the top seven this year. I think it would be fair to say. Really tough to call. You look at the odds, and no no ads. There's no bookmaker sponsoring this. As I say, I'm just gauging opinion from the market. Um, there's not much separating the teams this year. Not at all. So I think that that says a lot. There's, there's not many certainties. There's been a lot of upheaval, a lot of overhaul. And I think that those teams that have maintained a bit of consistency will be all the better for it. Relegated sides. Doesn't have to be in order. We'll just go for the three teams we think are going to go down. That's good because I wrote, not sure on the order, but the three will be. Nice. Uh, and then I went with Pro Sinone, which I think is an easy one to call. Um, mm-hmm. Coming up, you know, last time they came up, they didn't stick around either. Uh, Lecce, I think they just barely mm-hmm. survived last season, right? Um, yeah, they, they they took it really late. It was Colombo who scored the penalty away at Monza. That's right. And that was why we had a playoff too, right? Yeah. Um, that was because Verona and Spezia finished on level points. But yeah. Well, yeah, but I... I oh, right. Yeah, yeah. That's what the, impacted the table. The catalyst yeah. for it, yeah. Um, and then the other one I have is Hellas Verona. I, I think their time's come. I think they got lucky last season to survive um, when they shouldn't have, you know, if it was the previous season's um, rules. If it was just, you know, the bottom three teams go out, now that we had this play on thing, I I think they're just uh, they got lucky and they're not going to get lucky again. Mm-hmm. I also have Hellas. I have Salernitana and Lecce. Hmm. Salernitana are an interesting one. I thought about putting them in there, but the fact that they've been able to um, sign and keep uh, Boule Dia, to me, you know, he scored sixteen last season. If he replicates that, that's probably enough to keep them up. Um, this is a bit rogue. I, I agree with both of you on Frosinone and Lecce. Um, I actually, didn't say Maddie, you didn't say Lecce. Just... Never mind. My third team is Empoli. Um, mm, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just a hunch. I think there's always a surprise team that's down there. I think last season it was Hellas Verona. I mean, we knew they were bad, but they're a big club, and I don't think people expected them to. I mean, they finished in the bottom three on goal difference, but for the tiebreaker thing, um, they wouldn't have stayed up. But 
they've lost some players, have Empoli. They, they lost Vicario to Spurs. Aslani's gone on a permanent deal. Parisi's gone to top, uh, to Fiorentina. Bayrami to Sassuolo. Um, Bandinelli to Spezia. Uh, they, they've lost some players and they haven't yet replaced them. And I think that they're in for a difficult season. Empoli tend to do this thing where they spend like two or three years up and then go down for a season and then come back up. I think they go down this year. Um, so it's a bit of an outside bet. And I, I could tell you, Empoli at the moment are fifth favourites to go down. Um, the bookies really fancy Genoa to stay up. I can yeah, see I think Rodrigo. Still... I think they'll be fine. I, th- I think they'll be fine. But I can see, I can see them perhaps not being as comfortable as they're making out here. Um, also, they really think Cagliari are going to do well as well. Um, and I, I think they'll be fine too. But just interesting the way that they see it. Next. So the next one is the Capo Cannonieri, the top scorer in Syria. Last season won by Victor Ossiman. Uh, rather yeah, I think, it's, of course. I think it's a repeat. I, I think I he's did. always just been a really hot striker. His issue has been fitness. Um, is he hurt again, actually? He just got hurt, right? In preseason? He did, he's knackered his ankle. How long do we think he's out, though? Is it going to be a is few it? months? or? Yeah, keep talking. I will have a look. Yeah, I, I think if he can stay fit, he's going to repeat it. If he can't stay fit, it's probably going to be Immobile, who didn't win it last season because he couldn't stay fit. So, I don't know. Those are the top two guys. They, they're they always just banging in goals, so we'll see what happens. But I think it'll be them. I think I, I wanted to pick a Milan player, but I feel like we signed so many good attackers that we're going to have a very diverse um, scoring pool. Scoring. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think Which most is honestly good. Like you be don't like, want them all it. come from one person. Like it's nice to have agree. a Azamin, you know, or uh, yeah, how, however you say his name. I don't know, but I also picked him for uh, top yeah. scorer. I wanted to pick Leal, but I was like, he's not going to do it. And Maybe Ossiman, goals and assists, but Ossiman is expected to be out for six months. Um, no, I'm bullshit. I'm oh my bit. god, I was like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> But I, the reason I haven't picked him is because I'm backing him to pick up another injury. He, he can't stay fit for the entire season. Um, don't get me wrong, I'd love if we had a striker who could produce what he does in that amount of games. But he, he struggled, really, to stay fit even in pre-season. He only played in two of Napoli's five friendlies, like the main friendlies, not against club sides. So he's been he's Well, been wasn't it one of their new signings who took him out in training? Yeah, that's, yeah. Like that, that's not practice. a great look. That's not no. a great idea, is it? Um, yeah, I, I think he's going to miss a stretch this season. Otherwise, it'll be him. If Full full disclosure, if he plays 38 games, then I, I think he will be the top scorer, and I think it, it, it might not be close. But I've gone Lautaro um, because he's going to have to be the leader Stinky. of that attack, which he has already been for, for a little bit of time. Um, but he just scores plenty of goals, doesn't he? Um, and I think that... Inzaghi's going to try and build the system so it basically is entirely centred around him. There's no Lukaku or Dzeko to play off, which could be worse for him. But I think he's a player that, as much as I I hate him, uh, I love to hate him, really, because I'm a big admirer of his hold-up play, of his finishing, and um, not of his haircut, but, you know, that's by the by. I think he could score 30, to be honest, um, with a better midfield feeding him. And potentially better wing backs too. So I've gone Lautaro. Don't, I, I actually don't have the market for that up, but I'm going to guess that Osimhen will be odds on to win the yeah. uh, the Capo Cannoniere. The next one we've got is Milan's Capo Cannoniere or Milan's top scorer. Yeah, this one was uh, an easy pick for me. I went Liao. He was it last year. He was it the year prior. Um, the only thing that could change that is if Okafor becomes a starting striker. I think his runs and the way it, with how selfless Liao actually is as a player, I think we might see Liao's assist go up and, and Okafor might start scoring a lot of goals because the guy on the right, Christian Pulisic, is also pretty selfless and likes to play in for those assists. So uh, I think if Okafor starts and he's making the right runs and is, he's on point, he could do it. But I'm still leaning towards Liao to pull out like 15, 16. I have Liao down. Yeah, I just don't, like he's been it for the past like two, three seasons, yeah. so I don't see that changing. Yeah, yeah, full house on Liao. Um, I, I think... actually have them both for goal scorer and assists. So do I. So... Sorry to 
jump ahead. No, no, I do as well. Um, it, I, I think this is a big, big season for Liao because he's the undisputed leader, not just of the attacking department, but of the entire team. He's the highest earner because of the renewal that he got. He's gradually improved each season uh, in terms of numbers. Now the next obvious target is to hit 20 goals in all competitions, which apparently will net him some pretty nice bonuses if he does that. Mm. Uh, he's got to put the team on his back. And also, I think the fact that we've been able to spread the attacking threat out to the right side with the signing of Chukweze, Pulisic, uh, far down the middle, also as his backup in times of need. But like Loftus-Cheek, I think, could chip in with a few even. Uh, Rinders, hopefully, will keep the positive yeah. signs going from pre-season. Um, who knows? Even a player like Luca Romero could could come up with the goods um, more often than not. And Giroud down the middle as well. He's, he's never been like... He's a pretty selfless striker for all we know about how static he is and stuff like that. Um, and, and I think Liao thrives playing off someone like that. And I think he'll thrive with more space, which is why I've got him um, as top scorer. And I think he ups his goal tally as well. Consistency is massive. He can't go missing for stretches like he did last season. But sometimes you forget that he's still not even 25 years old. Like he's not in his prime. There is development to do. He can take another step forward next season. Hopefully, the new tactics do him well. And uh, yeah, I reckon he'll hit 20. I do. I think he'll hit 20 goals. Uh, okay, I'll just go. Uh, top mm -hmm. assist. Um, it sounds like you guys are both saying Liao, um, but I'm going with Christian Pulisic. <laughs> um, there's eight days left until, well, seven, seven days left until the season now. When does it start? The 21st for us. A week today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in I think it's the 21st for everybody. Oh, wait, never mind. I no, no. misinterpreted yeah. what you meant. Yeah. Um, in his preseason, he has six assists, three hockey assists. He won two penalties and he scored a goal. Hockey um, assists don't gonna... count for anything. No, I know. But I'm just saying the type okay. of creation that he's he's giving us. Um, that to me says he's going to be banging in a lot of assists and six of them preseason. Yes, there were some against Umitsane. There were some against um, the other shitty teams we played, but there was multiple against Real Madrid. There was some against um, uh, Juventus as well. So big teams that he's getting them in there. And I think he's going to start the season off before Chukwese comes in. And I think Chukwese is going to find himself in a position where he needs to earn that spot and not be given it. You know, he just... He hasn't been with the team long enough, whereas Christian has. So Christian's going to start. We know how Pioli operates. And if he continues to perform the way he is, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's getting very close to 15, 16 assists this season. 15, 16 assists? I didn't like pick out numbers. I just said Liao because he's done both the past two seasons. So hmm. I found but he's getting competition. So I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, if Liao ups his goal tally, that means that he's he's getting more, he's getting fed more mm -hmm. from other players. So that that could be a thing. I think Chuck could be up there in terms of assists. His assist numbers of, um, were, were good last season. Um, a lot of that on the right wing, as AJ says, I think Pulisic is probably going to start the season on the right hand side just because Pioli loves his guys that have have learned his system the longest and stuff. Um, so during that handover period. Uh, Liao might be allowed to build up a bit of a lead. Pulisic could chime in with some. I think even like if Okafor gets himself into a starting role, if, if he plays that false nine position, he could get a few as well because of bringing the wingers into play. And also Rinders, like, you know, if, if he continues the positive things that we've seen in pre-season so far and he gets someone who's on the end of those passes rather than Giroud, then we could be looking at something pretty serious. And uh, I think the idea generally is that we spread the attacking threat and we don't rely too much on Liao. But in turn, in a weird paradox, that means that Liao could get even better numbers because he's got more space to operate in. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but yeah, I've got Liao top scorer and most assists and um, earning his money. Milan's player of the season. Yeah, I'm just going to follow what you guys just said and it's it's Liao. It, it has been, it will be, it is. You know, it's... Um... The like you said, the attack is designed to spread it out to give him more space. I mean, he is the star guy. He he had the renewal, the big money, and it just the system's built around him. He's our player this season, whether he's performing or not, but he will perform and he's gonna win it at the end of it as well. 
legit what AJ just said. Make that three of us. Um, it'd be funny if we picked him for most goals and assists and then picked a different MVP. Right. To be honest. But yeah, I fancy RLC. Uh, now, breakout player. Final one is Milan's breakout player. Yeah, for me, um, I was looking at it. Obviously, it's not going to be Liao because he's he can't break out when he's established. I don't think it's going to be um, Okafor. I, I think Pulisic's already kind of been... He's already been at the higher levels. You know, I think... Chukweze has a high expectation behind him. Loftus Cheek was already a name that we knew. So I think the one guy that's going to stand above the rest as a guy you didn't know before this season is Tajani Reinders. I think he's going to fucking just blow everyone's expectations out of the water. He had the the lowest name value out of all of our new signings coming into this season. And he's arguably had the most impressive preseason just with the way he's already slotted into a brand new midfield with no players that have played together. And he looks like he's been there since day one. So... That's my guy. I think at the end of the season, we're going to be really happy we, we signed him. Giannis Musa. Mm. I think that everyone is expecting him to be uh, like have little impact this year and like not really like, I guess, knowing his position or knowing his spot on the team. But I think, uh, He's strong. He's suited for the Italian league, and he is going to absolutely kill it. That's also me being like a huge Musa fan and a huge fan of midfielders, so extremely biased opinion. Football without bias is nothing. Um, I'm going to go with I, – I, because I've obviously had to send this out to all the writers to get their opinion. Like Pretty much everybody, apart from you guys, has said Luca Romero, and I just don't see him getting enough playing time to be – Judged as the yeah. it's a crowded area. I wouldn't be surprised if a late loan <laughs> idea came about for him. You know, we, we might keep him about. He's obviously only 18. He seems to like being here and he, he's done well in preseason, but I don't see him getting enough minutes really to um to be classed as the breakout player. And I know what you said about um Loftus Cheek being an established name. That's right, everybody knows who Loftus Cheek is, but with the context of that he's coming off a down season and he's had the injury problems that he has had. And he's come here to to try and sort of rekindle his career, having been one of the highest rated young talents to come out of Chelsea's academy. Um, I, I'm saying him as our breakout star. As in people perhaps were a bit underwhelmed by his signing, especially after we'd sold Tonali. We were expecting a bigger name for the midfield. But I think he's looked bright in preseason. He always wants to make things happen. And I can see him chipping in with a fair few goals and assists because he's playing in his best position. And that's something that he's made clear during interviews and stuff um, is that he feels that he's at his best box-to-box midfielder on that particular side. So I am looking forward to seeing him. I think his physicality, his frame, his his shot, his dribble could cause a real problem for defences in Syria and could really help us against the low block as well. So I'm going to RLC to do well for us. And I hope he stays fit above all. Like if he gives mm-hmm. us 30 games next season, then I think he'll have settled into a rhythm and, and done well for us. But... Also, if Musa does well enough to kind of take that starting spot from him, that's good as well because competition drives quality. It drives efficiency and everything. So um, I'm hoping the midfield just thrives in general, to be honest. And that is our predictions for the 2023-24 season. I should have added on, maybe, um, who a flop might be, but that feels a little bit negative, to be honest. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but if I you was fancy... about to say who my flap was going to be. But... Oops, Go on sorry. then. Christian Pulisic. <laughs> wow. You're a wild one. Are I think con- that there's a lot expected out of him, and he's not going to live up to the hype, and I'm going to win $40. You're an enemy of Wasn't the Wasn't it $20? I'm going to win $20. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I... I don't want to pick a flop, but... Yeah, I'm not going to. No, I'm not going to. Right, we'll move on and do some questions then. Um, As mentioned, we will do the Bologna preview in the next episode. Um, We kick off the season one week today. Always feels like we kick off way earlier than the other... uh, Way later, sorry, than the other leagues. Like the Premier League first weekend has just happened. And um, what does feel... Syria is actually earlier than, than normal this season because typically we're two match days behind the other leagues and this one were one. 
But Milan got shafted, man. We're the latest game of match week one and then the earliest game of match week two. That's some bullshit, but anyway. That's correct. Questions. Yeah. Questions. Rohit asks, should Origi be given a second chance given there are no offers on the table? No. No, I, I think we pull um, a PSG and freeze him out until this guy gets out of there. I mean, if, if PSG could freeze Mbappe, why can't we freeze fucking Origi? Like, Listen, this get dude rid of this is bum. clearly very happy making like four and a half million a season, living in Milan, Italy, eating great food, drinking great wine. I don't think he cares about being frozen out. Fair, but I, I just don't want to see him on the pitch. It's going to be another Bakayoko, right? Except, Probably. oh god, for three years, for much longer. Yeah, I feel <laughs> I, I, I see both sides to this. Um, his first season did not live up to expectations. He gets paid four million net a year and he scored two goals. And he spent obviously periods out injured and had a really difficult start. But then also, we were the ones who gave him that contract, which I think was misguided from the start when there were players like Kolo Muani that we could have signed on a free transfer. Um, we were the ones who signed him knowing that he had an injury problem that was going to be tricky to get rid of. And then as the season played out, I think Pioli relied on him less and less because he didn't think that he was, you know, a good solution for him in any position, be it out on the wing or be it up front. And that probably has led to a, a, a strain in the relations that is now irreparable. To the extent that he's getting left out of a preseason tour to the United States, which, which doesn't really do any good for anybody, because it, it weakens our negotiating position when we're trying to sell the player, because they're like, you don't, you don't want him, you know, you've not taken him on the tour, and it doesn't really help in terms of what if we're stuck with him and we need to use him because we're paying him four million a year, so you can't have that just sat out entirely. But he's not been with the team, so he doesn't, he hasn't had the you know, the same amount of training sessions and he's not had the game time. So we've kind of backed ourselves into a corner, both with the contract that we've given him and with the way that we've handled it. And by the sounds of it, he he's not rejecting all these offers to be difficult. He's rejecting them because he wants to stay and make it work. And that's like an, an even wilder position because if, if we thought that by doing that, it's going to push him to be like, no, fuck this club, I want to leave, which is what we wanted, really. And it hasn't worked. What do we do then? You know what? What happens? Are we gonna? Are we, is it going to be another Adley thing where like he really wants to be here and what? rip up the what's contract? That? What's that? Was you drawing a bow and arrow? Yeah, that too. Um, we yeah. Hunger Games. Fire him, yeah. fire him somewhere. <laughs> Look, my gut feeling is that we we find something, but my gut feeling is that it's going to be a loan deal, and we're going to have to face up with this problem again next summer but I don't think you can reintegrate him at this stage unfortunately like too much time has passed the preseason games have gone that he hasn't played in so he's he's not going to be in the right condition to play um Amashan asks should we consider any offers for tomorrow no as long as we have someone big lined up to replace him I think tomorrow's had an abysmal preseason but I do think he's He's still our best defender. I think what he really needs is some competition for the spot. There's no one there that's mm. taking it from him. I think he's settled in. He's kind of comfy with it. It's it's like when Romagnoli was there. Romagnoli was our top guy, and all of a sudden he was kind of waning. Then we bring in Tamori, and then we bring in Kalulu, and then we bring in Chow, and all of them fought and earned their spots, and they looked the best because of it. No one's taking it from Tamori. We need someone else who could challenge him for it. I, uh, I, I don't think... I don't think that there's any false narrative with Tamori. I think he's been over-criticised at certain moments. And he, he was, he's probably been over-praised at certain moments as well. But on his day, he's absolutely our best centre-back. And that is while Kalulu is equally inconsistent, while Chiao at 21 is, or 22 now is still raw and has a lot to learn, while Kier is in his mid-30s and probably can't give us 15 games next season, you know. Gabir has obviously left and the rest are kids. So it's not like he's got huge competition, as as you said, AJ. He's he's 100% got to step up next season. He, he cannot have those same disastrous games. He can't follow a man-of-the-match performance at Spurs with shockers in the, you know, in league games to come. That can't happen anymore. Um, and backing him to do so, I think, you know, the fact that there's not been any rumours surrounding him leaving or any offers or, or anything like that and, and the fact that 
you know, he's had a full preseason because no international call ups to to keep working on his game. He made mistakes in preseason. Got to hope he got them out of his system, and and from match day one, he's firing and ready to go. Um, I have worries about the defence in general, but I don't think that selling Tamari is the answer to that. I think we've found a complementary partner for him, and now we just need a bit more depth for the competition. Um, Abhijit Mohan asks, which are the one or two summer signings whose failure would make or break our season? Ooh, um, I guess it'd have to be the midfielders, right? Since, you know, we signed the entire midfield. If they fail, we fail. Mm. And the attack, right? We doubled yeah. down on our attackers. If uh, same thing as last season, no bueno. I, I mean, controversial this. First one is Chukweze. He was the biggest investment and the biggest name that we've signed this summer. He's got to put up numbers because otherwise our idea of having a two-flanked attack isn't really going to work. But then you've got someone like Pulisic ready to step in and hopefully contribute if, if he can't. But he's the big name, is Chukweze, and, and that needs to be a justified signing. And I think it will be. Uh, but if he were to fail, it wouldn't look good. The other is Musa, and not because it's Musa but because of what his investment represented. I think if he doesn't play much and he doesn't impress when he does play, people will say, why didn't you use that 20 mil on a number six? You know, um, So it's not necessarily Callum. him as a player. It's him as the idea of what we chose to invest in at that moment. Perhaps a bit like CDK last summer. It's not necessarily that we weren't gassed to sign him. It's more like, hang on, we wanted a centre-back and now we switched to a number 10. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's more, the, more what it represents. Uh, but that is a good question, to be fair. Christian Espinosa asks, what, in your opinion, is our best 11? Um, all right. Mignon. I think I'm still going to say Calabria. Yeah, no. (laughs) I'm still going to go Calabria. I think the defense sets itself, to be honest. Chow, Tamori, Teo. Um, It's really just what we've been playing in preseason, but I'm going to go. I'm going to go Loftus Cheek. Rinders, and then I'm switching four two, four two three one. Going Christian down the middle, and then Chukweze, Oka four Leo. Um, same. Actually, I just don't know if Oka four is going to be. I think by the end of the season that could be our strongest starting eleven, but I think right now Giroud is still our number nine. Yeah, there's like a strongest 11 right at this very moment and then there's a strongest 11 that we think it could be in time and like mm-hmm. if Pioli were a perfect coach, which we know that he is not. Uh, Mainyan in goal. I, I still think Kalulu's future is at right back, to be honest. Um, but for this, I'm going to say it's Calabria. Captain knows knows the system inside out and everything. And we also need Kalulu for centre-back depth. Then it's Chow Tamori, Teo... Um, I don't know how any combination or any placement of our starting eleven can possibly have Krunic anywhere in it. Um, and yeah, I'm going to say him at the base of the midfield. It's mental that you know if we'd have said that a few months ago, that this position should have never really happened. But I don't see Musa, Loftus Cheek, or Rinders being able to play it, or at least they can play it, but it would limit what they're good at. So you might as well put someone there in Krunic who is not going to limit anything that he's good at because he's not particularly great at a lot. Uh, what he is good at is work rate, whatever. So uh, then I'm going to go Loftus Cheek and and Reinders as the Metzalas. Chuck Chukwueze on the right side. Okafor down the middle. Bin Giroud off. I think we need to play more fluid. We can't have him up front for another season. Giroud is our break glass in terms of in case of emergency centre forward if we need to pump balls into the box. Let's let's start Okafor. Let's let's lean into it. You know, we've got a difficult start to the season, but we can catch a few teams out by playing Okafor up front. They know what we're getting with Giroud. Uh Leo on the left hand side and and hopefully better depth on the bench as well. Um despite this is from Giovanni Pisani. Despite the rumors about being about him being up for sale, Piola is giving a lot of playtime to Adley at the register position during these friendlies, do you think he's won a spot on the team? 
I think it's because we don't have the midfield depth that we think we do. We signed a lot of midfielders because we didn't have a lot of midfielders. But the fact that Krunic is still being named in most starting 11s tells you how deep it really is. Um, I, I think it's also preseason. We saw a lot of badly in last preseason. Um, one thing that hasn't really been discussed that I think is what it is, is um, I think Adley is clowning around in practice and not giving his all. Each player, Chukweze, Pulisic, Giroud, Liao, the new guys plus the veterans have already said Adley is the funniest guy on the team. The only way you know that is if he's dicking around in practice, he's fucking off, he's making jokes, he's you know pulling hair in class, whatever it is. And maybe Piola just doesn't like that. And he's like, look, you need to give your all in practice and you're not going to play. Maybe that's why we didn't see him last year. I don't know. But just a hunch. Hmm. Everyone likes the class clown. Except for the guy in charge. The teacher doesn't like the class clown. The manager doesn't yeah. either. But, uh, you know, if the class clown has the skill, This, you know, he should be playing. So yeah, you're paying well- a lot of money. I suppose there are class clowns that have been good, but you have got to have the quality and the and the mm-hmm. and everything else to back it up. I think the problem with Adley is and has always been his work rate. Um, we we saw that Pioli only gave him one start last season, which was way less than what we were expecting. I tweeted something about like the Adley paradox is how the more we see of him, the more we wonder how this is all we've seen of him, kind of thing. And he's like this mysterious object because he has these bright flashes and you think, wow, this kid's got technique, he's got vision, he can pass, he can unlock teams. And that's what we needed last season. But we don't see him every day and we don't know what he's actually like and we don't know what he'd be like against better opponents because all these starts in pre-season are against, are with the B team, you know, and the, and the lesser sides. Um, I do think he's looked good at Regista, but there's no doubt in my mind that his defensive side of the game is not, He's not able to shield the back four. And ultimately, he was coming off the bench to play that role, uh, just hoping that he could spring it wide every now and again. Um, th- there's a player in there, and I felt the switch to a 4-3-3 would be good for him because he's a box-to-box player, so he could slot in there. But then we signed box-to-box players, so all of a sudden he's back down the pecking order there. So it's a really strange situation that's developed there. My gut feeling is that the management will take us getting our money back, so like 10 million euros, 8 million euros, if that offer came in because Pioli clearly doesn't like him for whatever reason. But also my gut feeling is, if he goes somewhere, especially somewhere in this league, we need to be prepared to watch him succeed. Because a manager that trusts him and can get the best out of him will milk his ability for every drop that it's worth. And there's something in there, you know, that there's something there football IQ-wise and, and, and with his creativity. He's called the, the Il Pittore for a reason. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe he goes, Maybe he goes abroad and does well, maybe... You know, maybe he goes uh, somewhere on loan and, and learns Syria a bit better and comes back a better player. And Pioli gives him a second chance. Or maybe Pioli's gone. Possibilities are endless. We'll wrap it up there anyway. This has been a fun one. Like I said, get involved with your uh, your predictions for the 2023 24 season. The list of them will be in the description so you can just copy paste and put what you think. Uh, thank you again to everybody who supports what we do on Substack. We've got more exciting content coming uh, this week including the bonus episode um, the subject of which is yet to be decided so that really is a mm. mystery box this week um, got a couple of ideas in my mind and uh, yeah bring your host Ollie Fisher find me on Twitter Ollie Fisher AJ yep Twitter 45 been fun um, and I'll see you guys on the bonus in next week yeah that was a good one uh, there are two birthdays today both of which they have won zero champions leagues combined mr oliver fisher and chiellini oh right and mila kunis oh, that's a good one that's a good one there's quite a lot of celebrity birthday birthdays with today. <laughs> yeah me too um there's quite a lot of famous <laughs> birthdays on august yeah. the 14th i'm gonna have to google it now Still yeah, zero yeah, champions leagues good. between the three of you though Halle berry uh is one of them magic Johnson. still zero Still zero. Uh, he hasn't won anything. Kofi Kingston. Oh, Magic Johnson hasn't won anything. <laughs> won I... uh, my favorite one, without a doubt, didn't hasn't won anything. But uh, my favorite athlete on the list is Tim Tebow. Ooh, Tebow. good stuff. It's Tebow's birthday. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Yep. 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 Mm. Three sixteen. Yep. Um, that's a great way to end it. Thank you for watching, everybody. We'll catch you in a week's time. Like, comment, subscribe.
Hola. Teo. Gol! Ancora Teo! È una meraviglia! Il gol di Teo Hernandez! Da un'ora all'altra! È una meraviglia! Senti!